In the reaction energy diagram, we can follow the energy changes as reactants turn into products during a chemical reaction. And by following the energy changes, we can answer questions about kinetics and thermodynamics. For kinetics, we're often interested in how fast this reaction occurs, and we're experimentally measuring a rate constant represented by this lower case K. And the energy that is relevant to the rate constant is the activation energy, or the energy barrier to reach the transition state. The larger the activation energy, the lower the rate constant. And this is an equation we learned earlier called the Arrhenius equation. Coming to thermodynamics, we now know that the spontaneity of a chemical reaction can be predicted using this new thermodynamic parameter, the Gibbs free energy change. And encompassed within the Gibbs free energy is also the change in entropy, the change in enthalpy, and the temperature. And so these other thermodynamic parameters are also important in this delta G value. So we would like to know under thermodynamics about what product is favored, the reaction direction, the extent of reaction or the percent conversion. These are all questions we've addressed earlier in our equilibria chapters. So what product is favored often is determined by the equilibrium constant K and what its exact value is. If it's a very large number, then it favors products. If it's a very small number, it would favor reactants. And also that will also depend on what value your Q or your initial concentrations are. The reaction direction then is when you start initially, you have the reaction quotient Q, and then the reaction will proceed such that Q will ultimately become equal to value as K. And then the extent of reaction and percent conversion, these are often problems we did using ICE tables, where we do have to consider the initial conditions and the change using the equilibrium constant to solve for how far a reaction goes. In this lecture video, we're going to see that the Gibbs free energy change, or delta G, of a reaction is directly related to the equilibrium constant, the reaction quotient, and the temperature of the reaction. Delta G, again, is the free energy change of a reaction and will be the direct criterion for spontaneity, where reaction delta G must be less than zero in order to be spontaneous. Oftentimes, chemists refer to delta G as the driving force of a reaction. If delta G is negative, that means the reaction will proceed spontaneously. And this means that the reaction can also do work on the surroundings. If delta G is zero, then the reaction by definition is at equilibrium and no reaction change will occur and therefore no work can be done. If delta G is greater than zero, then we know this reaction cannot proceed spontaneously as written. Oftentimes what that means is the reverse reaction, which would have a negative delta G, would be spontaneous. Now there is also the possibility that you can proceed with the reaction where delta G is positive if you put in energy. So if the surrounding does work on the chemical reaction and that amount of energy is negative delta G, it can compensate for the positive delta G of the chemical reaction such that together the Gibbs free energy change is negative. Delta G naught is the free energy change of a reaction at the standard state. And the standard state is defined as one atmosphere pressure for gases and one molar concentration for solutions. In reality, most chemical reactions do not occur at the standard state because that would require being restricted to these concentrations and pressures. However, the standard state is really useful because it allows us to ignore extrinsic factors like the amounts of reactants. And so, for example, the standard free energy change, or delta G naught, 
is actually a great comparison about the intrinsic favorability of different chemical reactions because they're all performed at the standard state. We saw previously that delta G naught is equal to delta H naught minus the temperature of delta S naught. The new equation now is that the delta G naught is also directly related to the equilibrium constant K by this equality minus R, the ideal gas constant, times temperature times the natural log of K. And we can rearrange this equation mathematically and solve for K with respect to delta G naught. And we would get that the equilibrium constant is equal to the exponential function raised to the negative delta G naught over RT. And you might realize that this is really equivalent to the rate constant K, where instead of negative delta G, we have minus the activation energy barrier. For all other reactions not at standard state, we would talk about the driving force of the reaction as delta G. And again, delta G is also equal to delta H minus T delta S. And these are parameters that, are, again, are not at standard state. Now, the delta G is also related to temperature, equilibrium constant, and the reaction quotient Q by this equation here. R is the ideal gas constant. T is temperature in kelvins, and now we take the natural log of Q over K. Another way of writing this equation mathematically is to separate the Q and K and write this as a summation of RT times ln Q minus RT ln K. And this can also be further simplified because minus RT ln K is the definition of delta G naught. This last equality here shows that the driving force of a chemical reaction, which is described as delta G, can be broken down into a sum of the driving force of the reaction at the standard state plus an additional driving force that arises from the different amounts of reactants that you start with, which is captured in the reaction quotient Q. We're going to use these equations now to look at what is predicted under special circumstances. The first circumstance is that we're at equilibrium, and that means our reaction quotient Q is equal to the equilibrium constant K. So in this equation, I'm going to replace Q with K, and that means the ratio of K over K is just 1, and the natural log of 1 is zero. So that would mean that the delta G of the reaction at equilibrium is zero. And that's a nice confirmation of what we described before. The next special circumstance will be what happens when we're at the standard state, or Q equals one. So remember that Q is a ratio of products and reactants raised to their coefficients. However, for one atmosphere and one molar, uh, Q will always be equal to one in value. So we can look at these next two equations and plug in Q equals one for the standard state. And if we do that, we have natural logs of one, which we know mathematically returns a zero. And so what it confirms from these two reactions is that at the standard state, the delta G will be equal to the delta G naught. And again, this is a nice confirmation of that definition of delta G naught. Let's return to the idea that delta G naught informs us about the intrinsic favorability of a chemical reaction. In this table from your textbook, we have different values of delta G naught and the equilibrium constant K, and we're trying to determine its significance for chemical reactions that are not at the standard state. In other words, we're trying to determine the driving force, delta G. So we already did this previously, just using the value of the equilibrium constant. And we know that when K is very small, it strongly favors reactants. And so the reverse reaction is strongly favored, 
But if we only start with reactants, then the forward reaction will only proceed by a little bit. When K is around 1, both products and reactants are favored and would be formed in significant amounts at equilibrium. As K gets much larger, now the reactions become strongly product favored. And if we start with just reactants, we're going to have a large change in the forward direction to form primarily products. In this next step, we're going to use the equations we talked about earlier to convert values of equilibrium constant to now values of delta G naught. And these are some corresponding examples here. And so delta G naught of zero basically means that both reactants and products are favored. When delta G naught is very positive and large, this means that the reactants are strongly favored. And when delta G is large but negative, this means that this is a very downhill reaction to products. Thermodynamics continues to be highly relevant and important to chemists. And for fun, I'd like to show a reaction energy diagram that was just reported in a scientific paper where the authors used computational chemistry to calculate the energy changes of two different reactions that start with the same reactants. And so the authors were studying this reaction where two sets of products are potentially formed, and they wanted to use thermodynamics to understand which would be more favored. In this first reaction here, going through this reaction trajectory, we do go through a transition state that looks like this and has an activation energy shown here. The second reaction has a different transition state with a slightly different activation energy, but now leads to very different products. So you can see that the activation energy barriers are not that different between these two reactions that are possible. But what is strikingly different is the delta G of the reactions. So in both cases, the products are considered favorable because delta G is negative. The first delta G has a much smaller driving force of only minus 64 kilojoules per mole. But the second reaction has a larger, much more negative delta G value of about 300 kilojoules per mole. And so based on these calculated values, that led the authors to conclude that the second set of products would be much more favorable from these reactants. A chemical reaction where reactant A turns into product B, we can explain why delta G naught and delta G ultimately affect how far this reaction will go to completion. And so the formal way of describing that is called the extent of the reaction. And that's also best illustrated using this graph here, where along the y-axis, we have the free energy of the system. And along the x-axis, we have the extent of the reaction. So I like to point out these three points, one at the beginning, two in the middle, and three at the end. So at point one, this is where we have 100% A. At point B, we have 100% B. And so the energy difference between these two points will be reflected by their delta G naught. And so because this is a negative value, you can see here that the energy of A is going to be higher than the energy of pure B. Now, in the extent of the reaction axis, right in the middle would be 50% conversion, where we have 50% A and 50% B. Point 2 represents the equilibrium point because it represents the minimum of this curve in delta G. And this is roughly about 70% B and 30% A. And you can see then that when delta G naught is negative, it does favor the product B, but it may not be 100% completion. Earlier, when we talked about these equilibrium problems, we would say that when we have 100% A as our starting point, that means Q is much smaller than K. And so the reaction will proceed forward. 
However, if we start with 100% B, we would say that Q is larger than K and the reaction will proceed in the reverse direction. And in the middle here, if Q is equal to K, that means a reaction has reached completion and there will be no further net chemical change. Chemical reactions proceed spontaneously to equilibrium. And now that spontaneity can be predicted by looking at the sign of delta G. So here, delta G on the plot of G versus the extent is really just the slopes along the curve. And so here I'm showing the slopes at points 1, 2, and 3. So at point 1, this slope is negative, and that corresponds to a negative value of delta G, which is spontaneous in the forward direction. So that means at point 1, we will spontaneously form B. At point 2, the slope is flat or equal to 0. And so that means delta G is equal to zero, which is consistent with the reaction being at equilibrium. And that means there is no driving force for any net chemical change. At point three, the slope of the curve is positive, and that means delta G is positive. So the reaction as written is not spontaneous, but the reaction in reverse would be. So that means at point three, we would be able to run this reaction in reverse to form A. This plot of G versus the extent of the reaction shows that no matter where you start with differing amounts of A or B, the driving force of the reaction will occur to minimize G such that delta G is equal to zero. If we were to start at 100% A, then the reaction would proceed in the forward direction to product B until it reaches this equilibrium point 2, and then no net chemical reaction will occur. On the other hand, if we were to start with 100% B, the reaction would proceed in the reverse direction until it reaches the equilibrium point 2. Now let's look at two different chemical reactions, A going to B, where delta G0 is negative, and favored versus the reaction C going to D where now delta G naught is positive and not favored. And so we're interested then in looking at the G versus the extent of reaction plots in both of these cases. So the plot on the left is just like the one I showed earlier where the G naught value of A is much higher than the G naught value of product B, such that the delta G naught of this reaction is negative. On the other hand, for C going to D, because this is now a positive change in delta G naught, the energy of C at the starting point is going to be lower than the energy of D. We know that when delta G naught is negative, that would favor products, and so the equilibrium lies closer to having more B. But when delta G naught is positive at equilibrium, now we're going to have more reactants or more C than products. And so for these two types of scenarios with these two plots, we would expect that the reaction on the left will favor formation of the product B, for the plot on the right side, at equilibrium, we're going to favor having mostly reactant C present. So if I were to start with 100% C, the reaction does move forward only by a little bit until it reaches the equilibrium. So some D will form, but most of the reaction will stay unchanged as C. On the other hand, if I were to start with all product D, the reaction will move strongly, but now in the reverse direction through a very large change to reach this equilibrium where most of that D has been converted to C and just a little bit remains. Thermodynamics is also very important to biology. In life, for most organisms, the energy currency is ATP, this molecule shown here that has three triphosphate groups. When ATP reacts with water, it releases a phosphate 
and forms ADP, where now you just have a diphosphate tail. And this reaction can also be run in the reverse, where ADP plus phosphate can reform ATP. So because these reactions are exactly the reverse of one another, their energy change has the same magnitude but differ in sign. So ATP hydrolysis is spontaneous. ADP reforming ATP is actually uphill in energy. So that means on the right side of the cycle, this is spontaneous and the energy released can be used to do work on surrounding. For ADP reforming ATP by re-adding that phosphate on, this is not spontaneous, but cells can often perform this reaction with some energy input from another chemical reaction. So ATP to ADP is really useful in biology because of its ability to do work on the surroundings. Here's an example of a chemical reaction that happens in the cell where glutamate reacts with ammonia to form glutamine. And here you can see the addition of the amino group and the release of water. This reaction is uphill with the positive delta G and so it cannot occur spontaneously. But by coupling ATP hydrolysis with this reaction, overall the delta G of these two reactions will be negative and therefore together this can be spontaneous. And the way this works is that when ATP is hydrolyzed, the released phosphate actually reacts with glutamate in a downhill reaction. And then this phosphate intermediate can react with ammonia again in another downhill reaction to form glutamine. Biology uses ATP as an energy currency to help reactions run in the correct direction even when they are themselves not favorable. I'd like to return to the reaction where ATP is cleaved with water to form ADP and phosphate. In many biology textbooks, this PO bond that's broken is often called a high energy bond because it can release so much energy. This is a misnomer from a chemist's perspective because if we look at what's going on here, this molecule of ATP will cleave into two fragments. And so the entropy change will be positive and that's favorable. To break any chemical bond, you will need an input of energy. And so the delta H of this reaction is actually endothermic and not favorable. So it's actually the fact that this is a weak bond and easy to break that the entropy can win over the enthalpy change. And one way of rationalizing why the enthalpy change is a small positive number is you'll notice that this molecule carries multiple charges. And so by breaking the phosphate group off, you do decrease the overall charge on the ADP part of a molecule.